where I worked with uh, the youth of clients from you know, private world clients to high net worth clients to, you know, you know, um, institutional investors, both local and offshore. And in the last two years, I've transitioned into a private wealth advisor, where my focus is really, um, you know, providing wealth advisory services to the high net worth individuals, private clients, as well as family offices, because I do feel like, you know, we need to protect and help to preserve the work that they're creating, particularly as they look at moving them from one generation to the other. Fantastic. Thank you. Look forward to our discussion, looking at succession, looking at the family office trends. Um, Abiola, I mean, are you also finding that clients have, during the pandemic, reflected on the health succession legacy has just come to the fore in a way that uh, it was in the background uh, before the pandemic? It's brought it right to their attention. Absolutely. Um, again, as you can imagine, we live in a very um, sort of challenging economic climate, um, both in Africa and also globally. And it's cost a lot of, um, you know, reassessment of values. And one of the things that we're striving to do at Atios is to align those values with um, their wealth goal. What, what, what used to happen in the past was a lot of um, in, you know in, um, investors just pretty just focus on returns and you know focus on you know I just want to make X amount of money but now there's a shift in the way that money is being made and essentially in what it has been invested in we're seeing a lot more focus on um, improved lifestyle so mm -hmm. for example people are taking more opportunities to do the things that they want to do they've always loved to do and again and also to focus on things that matter like Paul said children you know family legacy those are thoughts that are coming up a lot more um you know that, that, that are coming up for a lot more than before and particularly as the you know the the descendants the children are also veering off into various directions mm -hmm. it is actually forcing the um the principals the parents to start to reassess what they thought was going to be the succession plan and what they thought was going to be the transition plan so we're seeing that a lot more come up Okay, thank you. And we heard from uh, Nikkei on the on the video that um, the, the foreign currency aspect, volatility of foreign currencies is obviously a key focus for investors um, across the African continent. I mean, um, Abiola, do you find that conversations about currency and how clients are positioned in dollar, or euro, pound, other currencies is, is, is really something that drives a lot of decision making? Absolutely. Um, a lot of, um, you know, you have to understand in, in Nigeria, a lot of our wealth, um, primarily, particularly for people in the in high net, in the high income bracket, is located, um, you know, domestically. And so we've had a state of, um, you know, currency um, sort of deval that has continuously persisted over the last 24 months. And so what we're seeing is that for people who are asset heavy in domestic currency, um, we're beginning to see them clamor for, you know, how can I try transition some of my assets into more foreign and stable markets. I mean, the exposures for some of these investors are quite high. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the, the focus is now to reallocate um, both geographically and also diversify in terms of the various asset, asset classes. You did a session on real estate. It's a real big thing in Nigeria. A lot of um, you know, high net worth individuals are very focused on real estate, but they've now started to reconsider that asset class and ask themselves, particularly knowing that it's all domestic in Nigeria, that are there opportunities to shift some of that, um, you know, currency risk out of out of Nigeria, and so that's what we're working on. Yeah. So clients maybe feel overexposed, long property locally, that they're now looking to actually put maybe to work in other asset classes internationally. Is that Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Okay, interesting. I mean, Abiola, perhaps you could you could you could answer to that. In that, where 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 do where do clients in East Africa, for example? look to look to invest are they looking for developed market blue chip investments are they looking towards asia and india and china and thinking there's there's returns there and interest what do you find in conversations with clients about where they want to invest internationally so in Nigeria, for most of our investors, um, we, we tend to find that they prefer the UK and the US markets. Mm. I think largely because these are markets that they're very familiar with. Um, a lot of Nigerians have ties to either the UK or the US. And so they kind of feel um, a lot of um, sort of affinity to those markets and they understand them better. So we do a broad range of um, investments for them. So equities is very topical. Um, 
you know, um, and it ranges from direct um, equity, um, direct stocks, and all, also ETFs. Um, again, the focus is on growth and, um, you know, dividend paying stocks and stability, you know, stocks that are generally stable. Um, and the UK, in the UK, for most of our investors, it's really centered around property um, because the property market in the UK is one that they sort of favor. So when we think of that, they, they sort of look at those sort of um, those two areas. Um, other places that they would consider potentially would be South Africa. Um, again, I think it's also because um, we do have ties there, and people tend to sort of understand them. So they kind of look at it from the you know from the basis of um, property as well. Um, you know, that's sort of where you know where we see them sort of um, pitch their tent there. Very interesting. There's a question in the chat just asking, we get information about Africa being the next big thing for wealth creation. But what do you think the reason is most high net worth intend to invest abroad? I mean, Abiola, it's a big question, complicated answer, but what's your perspective on why high net worths locally um, do look abroad for, for some of their savings and investments? I think the fact is that a lot of high net worth already ex have established businesses in Nigeria, in, in, in Africa, essentially. Mm. And so from, a, from an asset creation point of view, the, the main source of creating their wealth is domiciled in Africa. And so for them, it's really just about diversification and which can, you know, in, involve both geographical and, you know, asset class diversification. And so it's just a way for them to hedge the, the sort of the risk that, you know, of doing business in Africa. It's not because they don't want to. In fact, quite a lot of them would rather prefer to, you know, have all their assets in, you know, in, in, in country or in Africa. But I think, again, as they, as they get bigger and as their wealth increases, there's also just that challenge of having to have a world diversified and well hedged portfolio so that they can be able to um i guess one sustain their business secondly also you know sustain their wealth and keep growing and preserving their wealth so it's not a preference per se it's more of a strategy that they you know that they have to adopt by way of um you know ensuring that the wealth continues to be preserved there's already a heavy exposure through their businesses in the local economy and it's simply to rebalance to to invest abroad so i think I think that's very interesting. Um, do keep the questions coming through. We've got plenty of time on this session to get questions to Abiola uh, and to Paul. Um, Paul mentioned about tech stocks being popular with clients. I mean, Abiola, we read in the FT about the Nigerian scene for fintech that, that, yeah. that sounds hugely interesting and companies raising large amounts of money and, and, and going global with it. Is that something you see very tangibly on the ground, the economic activity there in certain key sectors? Absolutely. I actually was going to mention that a huge part, um, a huge asset class that, you know, that investors are gravitating towards is VC. Mm. I mean, like they, there is, I would say there's a new VC firm opening up in Nigeria every other month. You know, it's been quite popular. And a lot of these VC fir firms and funds are financed by, you know, um, the high net worth. Individual. Of course, some foreign investors also you know, bring in, you know, money, but, you know, we also have quite an active local participation there from HNIs and, you know, and oligarchs who, again, want to get in on, you know, in front of that, uh, the wave, I would say, the tech uh, wave. And fintech has been a very popular um, destination for where some of that wealth, uh, so for some of where that funds is channeled through. Um, we've seen um, a huge inflow into the fintech. I think Nigeria is probably the largest receiver of um, funds um, in terms of VC and mm -hmm. in, in on the continent. Yes. So, and, and, you know, we continue to see that demand um, across and fintech definitely has been very popular. What all, um, another popular space that people tend to put money in is also the um, you know, anything that has to do with mass, um, the mass market that helps mm -hmm. to elevate, um, you know, um, what I say, that, that, that helps to um, create financial inclusion on the finance side and also helps to make the, um, the standard of living for the mass market um, people a, a, lot much, a lot more easier. So we tend to see a lot of investments flow through that space as well. So, I mean, on the succession and governance side, investors might end up with a very... Um, a valuable uh, holding in a company, a, a, a Nigerian company whose valuation is going up. Do you find the governance is in place? Is it held in structures that will allow value to be created? And we mentioned on the top about the succession and legacy being created. When when these these stakes are being taken, is full consideration being given to how it fits into a plan or that can be an afterthought? What do you see? 
usually an afterthought. I'm going to be honest with you. That's, that's the work that we're doing. And the work is, you know, really to set up that family governance structure, um, not only, uh, you know, currently, but also as, you know, as the family progresses over the years. It's something that we've seen that is generally lacking. Um, mm -hmm. generally, it's not because the principal doesn't want to do it. It's also because sometimes they don't really know how. And mm -hmm. so, and then the time, of course, as you can imagine, the dynamics in family um, bothers on um, emotions to, you know, um, logic. And so just having to navigate all of that. But again, I think one of the things that we try to do in artists is just to sit with the family, identify their goals and help them to put the governance structure in place. And the governance structure, you, you know, would also entail, you know, coming up with an investment strategy and a plan and, you know, and who in the family would be responsible for driving or sort of overseeing that process so that when things like investments in VC, you know, turn a, turn a huge return in the future, you know, that wealth, you know, it's been deployed aligned in, in alignment with the plans that have been set up. Okay, thank you. Question in the chat from Sharon, just asking what role do SMEs play in terms of domestic GDP and what function of you think would that constitutes um, private family wealth? I suppose this question is really about the importance of family business. I mean, Nikkei was mentioning that is her whole, you know, uh, segment and focus is around how family businesses create wealth and manage it. But do you think, uh, Abiola, in in the in the economies of, of Nigeria, for example, the SME sector is is an important engine. It's not just the big institutional names. It's the it's the large number of small companies that create employment and wealth across the country. How do you see the family business sector in in Nigeria as something that's active and uh, vital? Um, I, I, I cannot underestimate the impact of the SMEs in Nigeria. I mean, I think they're really the engine that drives a lot of economic activities. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. they're not the big names, so you don't tend to mm. see them. And a lot of families are actually, um, I, would, I wouldn't even call them SMEs. I mean, some of family business that we, that, you know, we, we tend to work with are family businesses that are at the stage of being scalable. So they're mm. really at the point where, you know, they started off as SMEs, but they've now grown by certain leaps and bounds that they're now at the point where, you know, they're sitting with people and having conversations along um, partnerships, you know, selling down some of their holdings because they've gotten, you know, they've built that, they've been able to build that sustainable um, franchise, not just in one region, but usually they've built it across a few regions in Nigeria. And I think they're really critical. And that's why I mentioned that a lot of wealth is actually embedded in those businesses because there's a, they, they have a huge cash flow potential that they, that they offer to um, the families. And so one of the, you know, and, 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 and that's one of the reasons why why they're very important, you know, from an economic based point of view. Um, so I think the, the key thing is also to make sure that those businesses are scalable, where they don't just remain SMEs, but um, they now are able to sit, um, you know, alongside um, large corporates, what we call large corporates. Yes. So that's the real, that's a real challenge. Thank you. Um, on, on the family office sector, uh, Abiola, I mean, Nikki mentioned it in the, in her, in her piece around, it's not about labels, it's about just bringing the good governance, the right people, making decisions around the family, and bring some order to it. Um, what's your feeling about how the family office scene is, is developing in Nigeria as you see it up close? It's, it's a buzzword that's thrown around and has different applications in different markets, but how, what's your read? Um, I think that it's become quite essential in Nigeria, and it has actually grown quite a bit in the last what mm. I say 24 to 18 months um, particularly where you have you know people um, oligarchs who have you know built a, a solid um, what I say enterprise and you know there's there's really just a lot at stake so we've seen a few of them you know build family offices with proper structure um, you know both domestically and internationally and we're seeing a lot more um, shift you know by some of these oligarchs who haven't yet done that to doing that what we're also seeing is an advent of um, multi-family office structures um, you know I think the reality is that there are some people who may not be able to afford the uh, you know the cost of running an individual family office but the reality is that they also do have those needs where they, they may not be big enough but they definitely are sort of you know can be positioned to transition into a full-fledged family office and so that's what we're seeing where multi-family office structures that would allow um, some sort of guidance and um, you know soft initiation into the family office process and um, put structures in place um, as Paul mentioned structures around um, 
you know, protecting their business, you know, protect, you know, um, helping them with family governance, helping them with, um, you know, um, setting up trusts, helping them with um, estate and will planning. So just helping them with that entire value chain and making sure that they're well positioned. Because again, while they may not be as big as the ones that are popular, you know, the, the ones that we know, the reality is that they're, they're economically relevant. Their business, what they do, has some sort of economic relevance. And some of these businesses employ north of about 200 to 300 people um, and, you know, they're paying salaries and even more and they distribute just not in Nigeria, but just, you know, across, across Africa. So it's really important that we help to protect those businesses and help them, you know, to um, sort of have the right structure and the right process. So multifamily offices, something that's gaining, gaining strength as well as individual family offices. Does technology also play a role because um, there's more and more solutions now that allow the reporting role that would have been done by a more expensive traditional family office to to be available to at a lower at a lower you know um, asset base and so that allows people to start doing pieces. So I've spoke to people recently more about virtual family offices with a professional and some technology doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Do you think do you think that's right? It provides a lower entry point for those. Uh, who have some complexity um, looking for a better angle on their wealth? Well, I think technology definitely will play a role. Um, mm. I think for us in Nigeria, because it's still early stages, um, the adoption to technology may not be as quick as we'd want it to. It's a lot of hand-holding that needs to happen. So a lot of face time, you know, mm. because these are people that, first of all, they don't even think they need the family office set up. They're like, well, you know, I've been managing my wealth for many years, you know, I've done this well. So it's really a lot of hand-holding. Mm. I mean, of course, the younger ones are more dynamic. Yes, you know, definitely technology will feed into that. But when you have, you're talking about people that in like the early 60s, late 70s, it's a lot of handholding, you know, you're pretty much doing the work. You're just getting the insight from them and helping them put it together. I, of course, as you transition to the next generation, then technology will then begin to be more uh, sort of something that you would use to drive that business a lot more. But at the initial stages where we're looking at the age range of about 60 to about 70, 50 to 70, um, technology may not necessarily be the driving factor, but we can't deny it from a reporting point of view. It would def it's definitely been very useful mm -hmm. and it would definitely be something that, you know, would help to make the reporting easier. But I, but I tend to find that one-on-one -on -one communication and just um, good old formal banking processes yeah. is what they need, you know. Trust and confidence is built, the technology <laughs> is a secondary. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, that's very interesting. And, and Paul mentioned before about the rise in uh, ESG as something that's just more part of the conversation, partly because it's being supplied and offered by more financial services organizations. But how do you see the discussion with, with I suppose, partly with NextGen, but also just generally with private wealth on on how um how portfolios are invested are is esg something that's on the radar more interest to people than it was before i think for it's for for um for individuals whose um businesses transcend not just um you know their current domic business domiciliation but they transcend other you know i guess more developed markets esg becomes topical when you look at it in nigeria specifically i wouldn't say that it's a huge it's not really a huge topic, but as they invest in other markets, as their businesses particularly are now, you know, being, um, you know, visible in other more developed markets, there is just a need to sort of focus on that. And that's one of the things we try to build in, because again, we, we tend to look at it not from where you are right now, but from really where you intend to go to. So we sort of build it into that structure, um, you know, and usually they, they're quite fine with it because again, for most people, there's just sort of, sort of that latent goal and desire that they have, but they've never really found a way to express it. So we kind of marry the two together and, you know, give them something that, you know, speaks to that. Thank you. Just coming into the last 10 minutes of this conversation, so still plenty of time to put questions in the chat. Abiola, perspective on, on Paul's comments. Honestly, Paul, I, I couldn't have said it any better. I think I have, a, I'm a living um, witness of what you're saying. My grandfather was very wealthy. He died about 30 years ago and we come, we come from a largely polygamous home. And, you know, up until today, I don't think his wealth, you know, it just pretty much just 
wasting away in some places, in some of his property. So I truly, for me, it's really also personal because I've seen that happen to me firsthand. But I really did. So I, I and, and that's a story for most um, most people that have grandparents who are wealthy. Wealth is really, you know, it's just not, it's just not available. It didn't, it, it didn't pass on. You know, it just died. A few made it through, but it just died. And so it's really now our, our, our turn and our charge, as Paul said, I feel like a warrior now. You know, our charge and our turn to help these families not make the same mistakes that have been made in the past. We, 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 we're here to guide them. We have a wealth of knowledge. Um, you know, I've worked in financial services. Paul is currently doing so. Um, we also have experience. Okay, one of the things that mm. tends to be lacking is usually you get something from, you know, a foreign market and you're trying to implement it. But we, we, we are local. We understand the nuances. We understand the, um, the, the moral issues, the family issues, the religious issues. So not only do we make a plan for you that aligns with you know, investment, best investment practice, but we also take into consideration those nuances that someone else may not really understand, right? And we help you to build a successful, you know, model that can be, you know, that helps for transition. So I think, yes, it's really critical. And we're right at the edge of that happening. So I'm quite excited about it. And I guess another aspect of that whole discussion as well on this, the first wealth transfer, as it were, is that <coughs> adult children educated abroad or go, go and live in the UK and the US. So family businesses, I expect, are, are wondering whether when's a good time to sell? Should we actually become investors rather than operators? And that there's no easy solution to that because the children who go abroad could well come back with new skills, new angles, new contacts and grow fantastic businesses in a in a growth market. I mean, how, how do you even start to help people understand and advise on these kind of things, Abiola, as to the succession planning in a family business context or when's the right time to sell, you know? Yeah, so I mean, you're very correct. Um, we have people, I mean, I, I have personal experience, uh, you know, people I know and businesses that I'm supporting who the children, you know, um, do not have any interest in the business. Mm. They, they're literally like, we don't, you know, they built a life for themselves abroad. You know, this business has sent them to school, paid their bills and the, and the children are like, well, that's 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 what you want. I, 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 I just want to be, you know, in fashion or in music or in tech or something. And sometimes the ability to fuse the two and marry those desires is not really there. And so the question, as you said, now begins to be, how does this business transcend to the next generation? So conversation around partnerships where mm. could we find a foreign partner that would be a part of this business uh, maybe to sell off some stake in the business um, you know do you want to be a part of a smaller you know want to be a part of a larger conglomerate you know so there are common conversations that are beginning to have or do you even just want to sell it in its entirety and just mm. break it up in parts and then you know take your money and do something else you know of course those things bring about a lot of emotion as you can imagine um, you know, from the children's side and from the parents' side. But I think our goal is to sort of help to marry the two, find the middle ground where both the children and the parents, you know, feel heard uh, and feel like there's a solution that is workable. Um, I do feel like the children have some compassion, but the weight of being part of a family that is successful, you know, sometimes a lot to bear. So we just have to try and navigate that. Okay, thank you for that. No, really fascinating area. Uh, we've got a question from Diana just in the chat that we're going to come to quickly. Um, how do you manage your investment in Africa if, if you're in the diaspora since we're not on the ground all the time? So I guess someone who's, who's may perhaps come to the UK is invested or interested in companies um, on the continent. Um, how do you approach that, uh, Ab Abiola, for example, on, the, on, on people um, looking at exposure and companies within Africa? I think the first thing I would say is find a, a reputable um, partner um, in Africa to, to work with. So depending on what asset class you want to invest in, uh, make sure you find a reputable partner. Um, if it's going to be stock broken or asset management, make sure you find someone that's reputable. Um, you know, Paul is in... Um, He's in Kenya, he can help you. I'm in Nigeria, you can reach out to me. I think that's the first step. And then the second step is I would say, um, do your due diligence. Which areas would you like to invest in, right? Um, I think one of the things that people, when they hear about African investing, they usually just throw a dart and pick what's most popular. No, I would say, do your research, find out what areas have high growth or, you know, and then when you do your research and you speak to your advisor, you're able to then, you know, come up with a plan that would align with what you want. What you don't want to do is just 
pick anyone or just do any investment because it's popular and topical. You want to speak to the experts. I'm, I'm a firm believer if you, you have a headache, go to the doctor. If you want to talk about your money, go to the professionals. And trust me, we would always be open and willing to help you. Fantastic. Trusted local...